Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast, finding you. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Thursday, June 9th, 2022. So if you're new to the format, tonight is a format where I take live questions from the audience. We have some left over from the previous broadcast. You can always send in requests, feedback, stories, questions to webinar at evoketherapy.com. If any questions have come through that email, those will also be in, in the queue. And anybody attending live this evening is welcome to, to add their questions to tonight's broadcast. And I'll get to those in the order that, that I received them. Malia, who is, who is moderating for me this evening, she'll collect those and pass on your questions to me anonymously. So with that, we have um, some leftover questions and I'll start there. The first question reads, would you describe the work you refer to in your therapy with a concrete example? Yeah, yeah, the last one we talked a lot about what the work is. The work is, um, gosh, that's a really good question. It's a very hard, I watched The Matrix last night and I've seen The Matrix before a, a few times. And, and and it was years after I learned about the hero's journey and, and the, the metaphor that it is that I really felt the depth of it. And so we watched it last night as a family and we decided we would pause it and talk about it all throughout. And the matrix is an allegory of the work. It's about unlearning. Uh, you know, part of the work is unlearning something. Is unlearning, for example, the idea that you're only as happy as your least happy child. Unlearning the idea that you have to give up yourself in a relationship um, to get love, to be loved, to be worthy of love. Um, the work can look like um, understanding that it's okay to say no, and that the guilt that you feel is something you're gonna to have to work through and tolerate and, and unlearn, unconditioned yourself, if you will. So I think those are really concrete examples. I saw something funny the other day and I didn't share it on social media because there was a word in it that doesn't really resonate with me, but I thought it was funny enough and illustrates uh, what I'm talking about with this. The, 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 the meme on, on, that I saw on social media said, before therapy, I, I, I used to hate to ring. I hated hanging around other people. I hated seeing other people socially. And after therapy, I was okay with hating other people social, hating and visiting with other people socially. So part of the work is loving yourself, is realizing that I might have a boundary or a preference that I've been told is wrong or bad or or not okay or selfish, but I don't have to believe that. So it's it's really about. It's mostly about unlearning. It's mostly about finding out what you really feel and need and want. It's learning to, to, to express that assertively, to require, it's setting a boundary, you know, saying to somebody, um, I, I, I can't, I, I'm not okay being treated like that. I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, this is my, you know, this is my line. This is where I, I stand on this issue. So it's really simple things. It's just about finding your truth. It's about becoming you, becoming your authentic self. And, the, the, the opposite of that is being the false self, you know, living your life according to somebody else's should, somebody else's idea, being in, in the matrix, in the movie that I described, uh, the protagonist was told that if he took one of the, one of the two pills, he would wake up to the reality. And part of what he realized right away is that in, in this metaphorical science fiction story is everybody was born into slavery, into, into the shoulds and shouldn'ts and, and, and being told who they should be and what they should do and what life they should live. So it's really just about finding those things and unlearning our, our conditioning, learning things like guilt and shame aren't a sign of morality, learning things like to, to love somebody is to listen to them with non-judgment and then practicing that, that work, attending to your own triggers, your, your fear triggers, your shame triggers, so that you don't become reactive to the people that you love or that you're in relationship with. Those are examples of, of, unraveling and unwinding the kind of conditioning that, that we grew up with. So that's, I hope that's concrete enough, some examples of what, what, what the work looks like. You know, there are two basic category, categories in relationship. The, the first one is finding out what's true for you, what you feel, think, want, believe, like, don't like, love, can't stand, whatever that is, you know, finding out what's true for you and, and, and speaking your truth in your relationships, living that truth. And then the other half of the equation in relationships is allowing the person to be who they are. You know, if it doesn't infringe upon your, 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 your boundaries, who you are and what you need for yourself, 
allowing them to be don't not having an opinion for example about uh, the way that another person should they live their life and trying to manipulate them toward that end even if the, the behavior in your mind is obviously toxic right if you love somebody who's suffering from substance abuse disorder substance use disorder for example um you can set boundaries around that you can take a stance around that but trying to manipulate and control and fix them is is bad for both of you really so those are other concrete examples of the work thank you for that so next question reads when applying to traditional schools when do you suggest telling them about the child being at or having transitioning from wilderness therapy does this does this scare schools away just wondering how i could educate the admins who do who know nothing about wilderness therapy or do most of them know how amazing wilderness therapy can be i hope my question is clear my son is getting ready to transition home i am looking for high school placements now for him i'm just wondering how to navigate this piece of the application especially given the fact that he was pulled from his former middle school in order to attend wilderness therapy thank you that's a great question i have a few thoughts about it um my first thought was it's okay to tell them and if they don't if they can't understand it then it's not the right school for you and then i thought well that's you might you, you don't really owe an explanation it would be like if i came to a job application and then told them about the things that i was working on in therapy told them about some of my old mistakes some of my old some of the things i've done that, that have been unhealthy in my life i don't know that i that I owe that to them. Um, so part of me thinks it's really up to you. Um, I, I think the reaction from the schools is gonna be based on how they think of mental health in general. I mean, a healthy, evolved, aware person, if they were told that your child went to Willis therapy, they would say, I'm sure he or she or they have some, some gifts and some wisdom that other kids who haven't gone through the struggle have. They also have some vulnerabilities that, you know, they, they have some at risk issues. Maybe it's self harm or, or depression or suicidality, or maybe they have anxiety related to a learning difference, or maybe they're, they're susceptible to substance, uh, to addictions and substances. You know, I don't know what it is, but, but I, I think the response will be as broad and as individual as, as what people think about mental health and mental health treatment. I remember I had a, I had a, somebody who used to moderate for me before Malia. And she was struck by how much I talk that I go to therapy. She didn't come from that world. And I remember saying after she gave me some feedback after working with us for a few months, I remember thinking, I forget to even, I forget that people even think that way. Sometimes I forget that people don't realize that the healthiest people are going to therapy. I mean, I really believe that. The only thing I know about you if you're going to therapy is that you're working on yourself. That's all I know. And if, you know, I was telling somebody in a podcast interview I did with somebody today on their podcast, I was saying, I wouldn't trust a therapist who, who doesn't have a, a regular uh, practice or at least a regular history of going to therapy. I, I just wouldn't trust them. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to me um, to, to work with somebody like that if I were a client. And I know some therapists won't answer the question, but I can tell you any, anybody who asks me the question, why would I not tell them? It is part of who I am. It is part of, of what I believe. So I'm getting off of the question a little bit. I don't think you owe it to anybody. Um, I, I think it could, it could give them some, um, some biases, some prejudice about your child. But again, that's going to be based on who they are. And if those prejudices are, are negative, and if they are um, emblematic of what the school as a whole feels, it might not be the right place for your child. That's just a thought. But but with this and, and most questions like this, it's up to you. And I don't think you have to. I don't think you should. I don't think you shouldn't. I don't think there's a there's one right right way to approach it. I would really honor whichever decision and however you made it. Now, if you care about the school and you want them to be educated about it, you know, th there are ways to kind of introduce it to them. You know, giving them podcasts, giving them my first book where I explain what wilderness therapy is and the stories from families that I've worked with. But if you've read that book, and of course, if you've listened to these broadcasts, you'll know that I don't have very much stigma left in me, even in my memory sometimes, of, of the idea of going to therapy or going to treatment. In my experience, 
the most aware people uh, that I know are the ones who have struggled with some stuff and who have worked on it in some kind of practice that, that supports the, the development of mental health. So thank you. Next question reads, I have guilt when I'm happy with my kids at home because I wonder if I should be sad my child is gone. Is this a normal feeling? Well, it's, it's not not normal, but it's, again, a sign of, of something left over from some conditioning. You know, the, it, it's, it's similar to saying if I'm mad at my parents, for example, it, it, you know, do I feel guilty because I also love them and, and, and am grateful for it? See, mental health and our evolution in mental health is all about being able to hold paradox. You can love your children and feel relief at the same time. Again, I, I, I wouldn't go out and tell them that because that places an undue burden on them, but it's it's real to be happy and relaxed when they're not home. The guilt, the guilt in a perfect world, if I could major, wave a magic wand, I would erase shame and guilt. And of course, many people would be terrified at the prospect. But see, love and compassion and empathy and connection to other people and connection to yourself, those are the foundation. Those are the building blocks of morality and empathy and kindness. This idea in Western culture, in a lot of cultures, Western culture specifically, that guilt is, is, has been kind of uh, conflated with conscience and with, with morality is a myth. So the guilt is the problem. The, the guilt is the, the, the treatable issue, if you will. The, the, the philosopher and, and great thinker Nietzsche said it, and many have, 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 have quoted him since, that, that we have to kill the dragon of should and should not in order to evolve and to become, he says in his mythology, a baby again, who we are. Even I wrote in my book, the, the, the shame and the guilt that, that Adam and Eve felt in the, the story in Genesis and covering themselves up from God is a story of guilt and shame. When we, I was thinking about this even today. I've made lots of mistakes. And in my mistakes, I've hurt my children. Everybody that I've cared about, I have hurt with my mistakes, with my, with my unprocessed trauma, with my, you know, my protections of myself, right? What we do... To say to 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 stay safe hurts those that we care about sometimes, and I've done my fair share, and more. And I was thinking about this today because I was I was being interviewed by somebody who has alopecia, and they were talking about how their their, their body turned on them, right? With alopecia, the body thinks that that hair hair follicles are a disease, and so it it, it kills it. I have multiple sclerosis. I have I, I do very well with it. I, I have very, very infrequent pain. I have numbness and tingling, tingling. I have some, I don't have any issues with balance. So I'm, I'm grateful for where I am with it right now, but I know what it's like intimately. I know what it's like to, to turn on myself physically. I know MS is a, is a disease where my body thinks that the, the sheath around the nerve cells in my body is a disease and it, it attacks them. And then they get inflamed and then they, be, they create scars. Multiple sclerosis is multiple scars, right? So I know the cost of turning on yourself. And I was thinking about that just while I was running my, my father, Aaron, just before the broadcast tonight. And in many ways, that's how people treat, I'll call them sins or, or symptoms or mental health issues, substance abuse disorder, self-harm, even violence. Right? We treat it with uh, authority and, and punishment and hatred. We have learned to hate ourselves and others when they make mistakes and hurt people. That, that hate prevents us from feeling the, the deeper, more vulnerable feelings of pain and loss and grief and sadness. Right? We, we, we develop this anger and this hate towards even ourselves. I make a mistake and I, I, hit, my, I hit my fist on the table and, and I'm mad at myself and I call myself stupid or I really hurt somebody. And so I feel ashamed and unlovable and I want to hide and, and deny it. Right. But that's not, that's the evoke message. That's not how we cure. That's not how we heal. 
we know that the only real lasting deep healing comes from loving yourself. But the fear is because we were taught it that if we love ourselves, even in our mistakes, right? If we, if we receive and live with grace, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, that we're just going to run wild, right? That, that somehow that, that erases the fact that people were hurt by our decisions, by our, our behavior. And that we'll be, we're going to become hedonistic and crazy, right? A wild man or a wild person, a wild woman. But that's not true. That, that's a lie that we were told to try to control us because we scared people that loved us when we did these things. We hurt people that loved us when we did these things. So we learn to hate ourselves from our parents and they learned it from their parents and they learned it from their parents and so on and so on and so on. Right? That's the challenge. Dr. Martin Luther King said, I think it was him who said, hatred does not cease with hatred, only with love. You can't fix the world's problems with hate and rage and anger. Those emotions can, can serve valuable uh, purposes in our lives to protect us when we are, are feeling vulnerable, when we're feeling overwhelmed, right? They, they can serve us. We can listen to them. But the real healing, the, the, the real work of attachment is compassion and, and self-love. So just like my body turned on myself, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised to learn someday that it was really just a replication of my own trauma. I learned to hate the parts of me that make a mess. There's a great line in The Journey of the Rogue Parent that I borrowed from a song that I love. Uh, the, the, the man who wrote it is Kyle Henderson. He's the lead singer of Desert Noises, which is the lead-up song on all of these podcasts that I do. And um, he talks about putting his mess on his tape, putting the mess on the table in, from, in front of his mother and father. I'm sorry for the mess that I made. But if you could listen to my, 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 if you could listen to me, you could see, you could see me, you could get beyond that. He's searching for that love and that self-acceptance, but because he made a mess, he expects to be treated with disdain and disgust, just like all of us. Thank you for that. Next question reads, historically drugs and alcohol, major ad addictive substances in our culture. While, while those are still huge and stumbling blocks, I feel like screens and scrolling are the new addiction and seen as 100% okay. When I try and look beneath it all, I think I am looking for the connection and community with like-minded people. Though I'm very aware of it and careful and set limits on my phone, on average I spend an hour and a half on social media daily, an hour and a half texting daily and an hour and a half listening to podcasts, half an hour Googling random stuff. That's five hours on my phone on an average every day that is not counting sitting behind a computer all day at work or watching TV shows or a movie at night. What are your thoughts and beliefs on this? I know it's inevitable to, a, to an extent, but it seems like this is how people are communicating these days. You know, th there's a great TED talk, which I've talked about before, so... Forgive me if you're hearing it for a second or a third time, but it's called um, Everything We Thought We Knew About Addiction is Wrong. And it's by uh, 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 the presenter. His name is Johan Hari. He's an Englishman. And, uh, you know, he talks about this idea that, that self-medicating is not wanting to be present in our own lives. And, and so part of what I've thought about with screens and all these things is we have a lot of things to, to help us not be present in our lives. And it can become habitual and addictive if it crosses a certain threshold and we're avoiding feeling, being present in our lives, in our relationships, in our sadness, in our pain, in our grief, then, then, then by its definition, it's, it's an addiction. It's habitual self-medicating. I remember, you know, one of the things that Johan Ari talks about is um, that, that Portugal was the first at the time that he gave the talk and the only country to, to legalize all substances. And I love that idea, to decriminalize all substances. And, and, what they, and they took the money that they were using to imprison people related to substance use disorder issues and they put it back into the, to the workforce and said, we will pay you to, to hire 
um, ex-convicts. We'll pay you to hire people who have struggled with the law. We'll pay half of their salary for a year. I forget the exact program, but something like that. And the country saw and has seen dramatic reductions in, in opiate use, right? In, in intravenous drug use, dramatic reductions. But it was a leap of faith. And although there were opponents to the, to, the, to the law in the beginning, nobody wants to go back to it in that country. Now, why am I talking about that? Because there's no way to legislate or draw a line. You get to decide. See, it's your life. You get to decide if it's too much. If you have a child, you get to decide if it's too much for them. But not on a spiritual and psychological level. You know, part of the difficulty with taking screens away from from children is it's kind of like a food disorder, like an eating disorder. You have to have food to live, and it's getting to the point where you you have to be connected to some screens some of the time to do your job. I, I'm sure there are jobs that aren't like that, but my job is right now happening over, over a screen. You're listening and watching me related to electronic devices. So the idea of, of saying that we can eradicate screen time and, and, and what's too much is like saying what's too much food. It's the same kind of dilemma. And I like when things are legal because I, I, I did not like, have never liked, the parents have used the, the illegality of a specific drug as a reason for why a child shouldn't do it. The, the, the only reason. Because there are plenty of legal things. Alcohol is legal. Alcohol does more damage than a lot of drugs that are illegal. Does that mean it's right? Not necessarily. And, and the, the, the people drinking, they get to decide when it's too much. So you get to decide. You get to decide for yourself. And if your children are living with you and you're supporting them, you, you get to decide for them to some extent. But part of it is an experiment, right? Part of it is them learning by some kind of mistake also. And since most human beings in our culture are, are going to be around screens by necessity at work, the idea of, of removing them is like you said in your question, it really doesn't make any sense. Just like if you have an eating disorder, you can't stop eating to solve it. You have to figure out what's your relationship to food? What's your relationship to screens? Are you dissociating through, through screen using? Meaning, are you trying to be, it's the opposite of mindfulness. Mindfulness is being present. Mindlessness is what people are seeking when they self-medicate. They're seeking to be away from their life for a moment, for an hour, for an afternoon or an evening. <clears throat> Somebody says, please explain the difference between compassion and rescuing and enabling. Again, more than you would imagine, these, these, you know, the line, uh, compassion is having empathy and love. I, I can hold boundaries with people that I have compassion for. I can have an alcoholic in my life or a drug addict in my life and have no judgment and, and all the compassion in the world. Even if my partner, who is, she's not in struggling these areas, but I can have compassion. But that doesn't mean that I have to give up my time, my energy, you know, part of my life to, to support um, somebody else's substance use or somebody else's addiction or somebody else's issue. So it's about stepping in and doing more than your share. It's about, it's about, it's about rescuing someone from the consequences of their own behaviors. It's about, uh, you know, I've said that, I said this to my son in family therapy recently. I said, when talking about screen time, this kind of puts the two questions together. I said, look, um, the problem is, I said, is that today, you know, we have, we have Uber, we have uh, food delivery services. You know, we can have, if we want to, we can have all of our relationships be, be through screens. And I, I said to my son, if I provide too much of that for you, you don't let, learn the lesson that I had to learn in my life to earn the money that I earned to support myself. So I feel like it's enabling if I'm allowing you to always use, when you're at college, to always use food delivery services instead of having to go out and grocery shop or, or even go to a restaurant, right? Or walk walk to the, 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 the place on campus where you can eat at a, at a relatively inexpensive cost. I can afford it. 
I can afford to pay for your food delivery, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's the right thing for us, for you, for me right now. So that's going to be my boundary. You're, you're not going to have food delivery while you're in college, except for on rare occasions is an example. Doesn't mean I don't have compassion. Doesn't mean I, I don't even use food delivery myself because I do. But, but so I don't have judgment about it. My, my, my younger teenage child says she wants to try substances. I have compassion for her. Substances can be fun and, 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 and really entertaining. That's why people do them. Obviously, um, they can make you feel better with very, very little effort uh, on your part. But I said to her, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to drop that fight while your brain is underdeveloped. And I said to her, I won't judge you if you drink in your life, if you use THC in your life, I won't judge you. You can do that. But while you're 14 and 15, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to stop fighting for that because it's brain development. So see my response and my boundary is clear. I'm not, I'm not rescuing or enabling her, but I have compassion, genuine empathy for her. So that, that's the difference is one is a feeling of, of, of non-judgmental love. And one is about whether or not you can hold a boundary because of the guilt you feel or what I call your empathic misery, right? We, we, we feel what our children feel. We over identify with them and we get swept up in that. And we want to take away their pain because we can't, haven't quite sorted out in most cases, our own childhood and the fact that our parents weren't there for us. And so we overcompensate by double and tripling and quadrupling down on being there for our children. We don't let them suffer the consequences because we don't want to be our parents because we haven't done the work to, to, to work through our anger and our forgiveness of them. I went a little bit off topic, but, but I did. Somebody writes, how much do you suggest that we share about what we are learning with our children? Example, my serenity is my responsibility. I love when parents share lessons that they're learning or more importantly, things that they are unlearning. Now, your, your child might not get too excited. They might, might respond the way that you want, but there still is a gift. I mean, I think to, to, to turn the barge around, if you will, you know, your children and you, and you hopefully, if you're listening to this or, or watching this, I got to believe that, it, that it's you. You are uh, uh, somebody breaking the chain of intergenerational trauma, transmission of trauma. And that's a big deal. The more you can tell your children that you're learning and th th that you're still a student yourself, you model for them that it's okay for them to new learn new things. I love when parents, for example, say, my first instinct when I got your letter or got the report that you, know, that, that you did something, acted out in the wilderness, my first reaction was to lecture or to tell you how angry I was, but I'm learning that it's not about me. And I'm learning that my serenity is my responsibility. So in that way, you're honest with your initial reaction. So you're not lying. You're authentic and, and even humble and talking about it. And you're talking about your new practice. You're trying to replace the old programming with new programming. I think it's wonderful. Don't expect to, to, for them to engage it as enthusiastically as I would, or as your partner might, or as your friend or your therapist might, but it, it, it does model for them that you're on the journey too with them, that you're a, a student also, and that you have dents and bruises that are, that you're attending to and, and trying to heal so that you can be there for, for them in, in more authentic, capable ways. Somebody wrote, can you expand on helping a parent with codependency to decide whether to kick an adult out of the house? Is letting them stay enabling? I will tell you the story that I told in the journey of the rogue parent to illustrate this. Right? The, the, the parent called me. I'd been working with them in parent coaching. The child had gone through our program. This is many years ago. The parent contacted me and said, my adult child, 20-something-year-old child, has asked me to bring a certain brand of cigarettes that he can't find in the town that he can't find where he is after he leaves your program and goes to his or her aftercare program. They're, they're sober living. And so the, the parent called me saying, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, I can imagine a couple of things. I could imagine you coming with the cigarettes with that brand of cigarettes that 
that your child requested and handing it to your child and saying, this is me. You know how I feel about smoking. You know, my, my, my mother died of cancer. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a harmful, you know, habit to your body. But me giving you the cigarettes is the symbol that I'm not in control of whether you smoke or not. You're an adult. That's up to you. Now, I don't want you to smoke in the car, but this is a symbolic moment of me saying you can have it. I also can imagine you saying, showing up at a graduation from a book and saying, I didn't bring the cigarettes because I'm not going to participate in that. You know how I feel about smoking and it violates what I feel comfortable doing. So see, it doesn't matter what you do. Enabling isn't defined by the behavior, by the act. Enabling is defined by the dynamic and the relationship you have with the child and their issues. The true story I also told in the journey of the rogue parent, where a mother, when an adult daughter was coming home for a visit, the daughter asked her to drug test her while she was home. She had actually relapsed during a previous visit, but the program welcomed her back because she showed that she was committed to continuing her sobriety and her work. And the mother said to the daughter, I won't test you when you're home. And I was kind of surprised and ready to give her some information about how testing could be helpful to her daughter. But then the mother said something I couldn't argue with. The mother said, because I'm learning that I'm a codependency. And if I start to take responsibility for your sobriety, my disease is at risk of relapse. Yes, if I see it, if I see you using it, it you, you know, it shows up in my house, I'm going to take a stand and you can't be here. But I can't participate in it. So again, you see, it's not really the behavior. It's not the yes or the no. The cigarettes are not the cigarettes. It's your relationship to it. That's why I could it, I can imagine a, a parent saying, I'll let my drug addicted child stay at home and having that be a healthy thing. I could also imagine them letting their child stay at home and that be an unhealthy thing. I can also imagine them kicking their child out of the house and that being a healthy thing. I can also imagine them kicking the child out of the house and that being an unhealthy thing. Does that make sense? It's about why you're doing it, what you're trying to accomplish, where it's coming from. If it's coming from a boundary to take care of you, it's not enabling or rescue. If it's about guilt or, or, or your shame or trying to make them not be mad at you or, or, or trying to make them feel a certain way, I don't want them to feel stigmatized. I don't want them to feel ashamed. I don't. If you're trying to control them, right? Whatever you do from a place of fear and control won't be healthy in this, the way I'm talking about it tonight. And whatever you do from a place of love and authenticity and courage will be healthy. So the act is not the definition. It is how clear you are on your psychological boundaries with the other person and their, and their behaviors and their disorder. It's a really subtle and difficult thing to, to explain and to understand. So I, I appreciate you asking. And I hope that that helps. Somebody writes, we started therapy last week with a family counselor. We all have tools. The teens rarely use theirs, of course. She wanted a specific issue. We said chores. Our kids have developmentally appropriate chores and are very capable, but do not do them, maybe 40% of the time. 60% is not acceptable to us, especially when they expect us to go above and beyond for them. We feel like the, these 20-minute daily responsibilities are messaging with our relationships and time as a family are messing with our relationships as a time and a family. We just want to count on our kids. Her idea is that our kids are entitled um, these days. Kids are entitled these days, and they clearly aren't suffering enough when they don't meet our expectations at home. She shared that one of her past teen clients uh, was left a, a just with just a mattress and furniture in his room before he cracked and started caring about his chores. I have no doubt that method works, but I feel like it might be short-sighted. I wanted to get your opinion. It doesn't feel right to me. It is really hard to find a family counselor. We waited for six months to get this one. Obviously, I wasn't there, and I didn't this. Um, I, I didn't hear what they said. But based on what you said, that would not be my response. I don't think the work has anything to do with your kids. I think worrying about your kids being entitled or not is the problem. None of your business. None of her business. You have to figure out what your boundaries are, especially the part where you say. They expect from you, but then you have this resentment associated with the fact that they they want 
you to do more for them than they're willing to do for you. And the other thing is, I don't care if you give them 20 minutes of chores or two hours of chores. There's no right answer. There's no right in this. That's the shift that evoked. You see that it's not that far off from Codependence Anonymous and Al-Anon or adult children of alcoholics. It's not that different than that philosophy. The, 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 the task here is what boundary do you want to set? A healthy boundary. L listen to this. This is so, this is somebody else wrote this. It's so subtle and beautiful that it, that it just, somebody wrote a healthy boundary is the distance between me and you in which I can still love me and you. So if you have resentment and anger, it's because you're not setting good boundaries. That's your issue. And the anger and the resentment is poisoning you and your life. Now, the hard part is, if you set a boundary, there's going to be another loss, another cost. The child might say, screw you. The child might say, you're a horrible parent. You might feel guilty when you watch the child suffer in, in relationship to the boundary that you set with them. Those are the, the, the dragons on your journey that you have to face. You have to face the gear, excuse me, you have to face the guilt and the fear that boundaries require you to face. The nonsense about them being entitled is, it doesn't, it doesn't, that does, it's, it's not even, it doesn't even matter. It, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. That's not the issue. The issue is you've come up with something you feel good about and you've asked for it and, and you have to figure out what your boundaries are going to be around that. The child has to feel the other. My daughter wrote something last night, my, my adult daughter. It's a really cool quote. She said, the child that is not, that is out in the middle of the, she wrote this, the child that is out in the middle of the ocean may be free, but the child also needs an edge, a wall to rest up against, to feel something other in their lives. Yes, the wall is annoying at times or the boundary. It gets in the way. But to never feel anything, any otherness, right? That they're living with an other person who has needs and wants and preferences and boundaries. That's what boundaries are, is your needs, your wants, and your preferences clearly stated and, and, and followed up on. The child that never has to feel anything, no edges, no edges of, of the others in their lives, ends up feeling terrified and exhausted. That's what my daughter wrote last night. She's Emma Reedy. She's a, one of the, the coaches at Evoke and, and facilitates our intensives. The child, if, if your children are entitled, I don't use that word in this way, but if they are entitled, entitlement is a wound, not a character defect, right? Remember, I love this quote from the philosopher Charles Eisenstein. He said, evil is not the cause it's the it's the result people turn evil quote unquote not a word that i use also but people turn that way because they have wounds that that, that that they're protecting with their rage and their hate and their their unkind and cruel actions of others it's just simple mental health so if your child is entitled they're not somehow flawed. They're expressing a wound. They're expressing a, 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 an, un, an unspoken, undealt with trauma. And it might be exactly as Emma says. Have you not been enough of a self? Have you not taken up enough space? I, I spend a lot of time, time with, with our, our parents on these podcasts and in my books and in my lectures talking about developing greater capacity to be non-judgmental and hold space for your children. And a lot of parents need work with that. But, but the reason I wrote the audacity to be you in the first chapter was, was finding you. The reason our program is called finding you. The reason the podcast is called finding you is because a boundary is, is your space. It's who you are. I don't like being talked to that way. I don't want mushrooms on my pizza. I'm not okay with you leaving garbage on the kitchen counter. I'm not okay. Whatever it is, I'm not okay with you smoking underage or in our house. You see, so, so it's just the anger and the resentment that you feel is a trigger 
that you need to get more clear about your boundaries. It's a trigger for you to change, to be clear about you. That's where the dance of anger talks about. You know, she says anger is only an effective, you know, valuable thing in our life if it causes us to be more clear about ourselves, not about other people and their disorders. Who cares if they're, they're them being an alcoholic, a drug addict, or entitled narcissist is not the important part. I wrote once that, you know, when people tell me that their ex partner, their ex spouse is a narcissist, my response is, well, that's, that's interesting. But what's fascinating is why did you marry a narcissist? That's the thing that's going to change your life. You figure that out and work through that. You're okay. But identifying the narcissist in the world, any first year graduate student can do that. Thank you. Somebody writes, how often do you recommend, how often do you recommend going home versus therapeutic boarding school? Well, statistically about 60% of the time we 60 or 70% of the time we recommend some kind of follow-up program. And it's a complex matrix that, that we, that we look at. It's not just graded on some kind of uh, objective curve about or objective scale about how healthy or unhealthy the, the child is. It's their age. It's the, the, the risks of their behavior. It's how the family's set up. It's what school they're going back to. You know, you, you, you mom and dad are, are part of that assessment. And parents are really terrified to hear that. They don't want the child to have to stay away because they're not ready. They feel too much guilt for that, but it's okay. It's true. We cannot want that to be true all the time, but it is a part of the equation. You know, the, 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 the woman who wrote the drama, the get the child, in my opinion, the most important book ever written about child development ever, you know, she says a, a mother and back then in 1979, it was always mother, but she says a mother that, that's not especially nurturing can, can still provide for the child what the child needs if only she will allow the child to get it from somebody else. The father of attachment theory. The entire theory that talks about how our attachment with our children is, is predictive of their mental health. John Bowlby. He talked about how boarding school for, for young folks, not therapeutic boarding because he wasn't thinking about that, didn't exist in his, in his world. Um, how boarding school can be helpful for children. Attachment isn't about physical proximity. When your daughter or son get in a car accident and they're brought to the emergency room, if that you have the, 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 the tragedy of that happening in your life, the doctor doesn't have you right near their bedside while they're operating on them. That would be insanity. You would get in the way. You would become a problem. So would I. We all would. They say, get out of the room. I'll come to you when we've stabilized your child. And then you can come in for a little while, one at a time. So in that example, a healthy attachment is actually walking away. So um, how often do I recommend going home? Every time I think it's um, the, the best option for where the child and the family are at at the time, given all the circumstances in their life. About two-thirds is the number if that's the, if that's what you're looking for. Somebody asked, what are the strength based aspects of wilderness? Um, one of the variables that we see improve in wilderness very specifically is, um, is internal locus of control. Think about Viktor Frankl on the cover. I just happen to have a book here. I don't usually have it on my desk, but on the cover of the journey of the, of the heroic parent, um, Viktor Frankl, the quote that we used was, when we are no longer able to change the situation, we are challenged to change our, ourselves. And in wilderness therapy, you can't change the weather. You can't change the temperature. You can't control the other seven group members. There's a lot outside of your control. And so you start to develop this awareness that the only thing you have control over is how you deal with it. And that is part of building resiliency building strength. I've done a, I've done a broadcast on this. Malia, you can look up the link to the YouTube or, or the podcast um, that, that talks about grit and resiliency and wellness therapy. 
and also it talks about the efficacy of wilderness therapy. They talk about similar things. Um, what we try to do for all of you is we try to reward. This is I'm gonna. This is a very dense sentence or two, so I'm gonna say it very very slowly. In my opinion, my training, what I've learned to do is we reward, we, we shine a loving, warm, reinforcing, accepting light on any person's step toward their authentic and real self. That's the strength-based approach at Evoke. If you tell me, your therapist, that you're angry at me, you better believe I'm going to praise you for that. I can't tell you, I can't, I cannot explain to you how hard it is for, for therapists. It took me a lot of years to learn it. And most therapists never learn it. That one of the most important times in, in therapy is when a client comes to you and says, I didn't like what you said. I didn't like what you did. You hurt me. I'm angry with you. If you're lucky enough as a therapist to hear that, you have the chance to do something different. And what you would do if you were doing your job is you would say, I'm so glad you told me that. Thank you for sharing that. And when you can, when you can say that to, to a child, to a parent, to, to anybody, then they know that who they are is safe, that they can be themselves. But because many therapists don't know that that's the task, they don't know that they're trying to encourage the real self. They don't even know what that is. They're just dealing with symptoms and problem solving. Um, they haven't done their own work. So they don't have a secure base to operate from. So when you come at them with anger or frustration or sadness, they want to be good and they try to talk you out of it, just like your parents did to you, just like you do to your parents. I said to our therapists not too long ago, stop treating the parents in the same exact ways that you're complaining about the parents treating the children. So when a parent says, I don't like what, you, what you're saying to me, stop and listen and thank them for the honor of, of trusting you. So the strength-based, it's not a phrase I use, but, but I know what it is. The, the, the strength that we're, 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 we're focusing on and, and fanning the flames of is the, the authentic, the real self. And again, we've been taught to fear the real self. We really have. We've been taught that if we are who we are, that's what The Matrix, the movie that I watched last night, is about. The Matrix is, is an analogy for the dominant culture. All the things that I've talked about tonight that we need to unlearn. And you can watch it. If you watch it again, you, you'll see that every conversation about the matrix applies to the, 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 trauma, uh, the trauma that you've been handed by your parents, the, the ideas of should and shouldn't, about right and wrong, about what is and what is not. And you have to unlearn all of that to become a person. Somebody writes as a comment more than a question. In relation to your earlier comment about, about therapy being the answer to become healthy, my ex has been in therapy for decades and engaged in, in parental alienation when we got divorced. Maybe he has been with the same therapist too long. I'm certainly not, I, I, I certainly did not realize how unevolved he was and did not understand what was happening when he engaged in this revenge tactic at the time when he was engaging in PAS, parental alienation. But as the son of an alcoholic father, his black and white thinking makes sense but did not fix him. Going to therapy, unfortunately, was not enough for him to do the work. I mean, that's, that's the old horse to water thing, right? It is possible to go to therapy or go to 12-step groups. It's possible to go to the gym and not get healthy, right? It's, 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 it's entirely possible. Uh, sometimes... I hold the, the 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 awareness that I've developed in therapy as a as a miracle. Sometimes I can't even understand why I, I got out of it what I got out of it. It was so miraculous. So fundamentally, paradigmatically, it was a paradigm shift. It was a transformation. The world changed colors, tilted on its axis. Right? The, the, the whole world changed. My my thoughts about people about mental health, about myself, about God, about everything changed as a result of therapy 20, 
three years with my current therapist and another seven to 10 off and on before that. But it is possible to get nothing out of it for sure. It's entirely possible. It takes gut wrenching. Um, it's gut wrenching to face your, 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 your fear, your guilt and your shame and to have success in the battle against it. What I do believe is having an attachment based therapist, one who understands what the work is about becoming who you are. Uh, sometimes they, they might be called a trauma informed therapist. I do believe that th those are more effective in this work. Again, it's not that I think cognitive behavioral therapists or dialectical behavioral therapists or therapists who use EMDR or brain spotting aren't, aren't, those are not effective tools and ideas. They all are. We have therapists that use all of them, but underneath that is this awareness about how human beings develop and, and why they develop symptoms and how to treat those symptoms back to the root wound, the root trauma, the root injury. So it's a combination of a lot of things that have to come together for somebody to make use of therapy. Someone writes, did you find that there are practices to help center and ground you? Is there a meditation you really like? Are you familiar with Julia Cameron's artist's way and the idea of morning, of morning pages? You wake up, open your morning journal and write three pages of longhand before any thoughts come out of your head. The idea is to clear your mind, process emotion, and be in the moment. I'm interested to hear about your suggestions. You know, there are, there are many roads to Rome. There are many ways up a mountain. Meditation and mindfulness is absolutely one that, that, that I believe has an effectiveness. I do have a mantra meditation when I'm overwhelmed. But for me, therapy is a big part of my self-care practice. My, my boundaries are part of my self-care practice. Just last night, we were sitting down at, at dinner and my wife offered some thoughts about something at work. And I said, my, very kindly, I said, my work day is over. Like I, I, I said it as gently as I could so as not to trigger her defense. I said, that feels like work if I'm going to talk about that, that right now and I want my work day to be over. And we ended up watching a movie together as a family after that, like I said. So um, I, I've read, I love the language of letting go as a daily reader. I've used that. I don't journal, but I know lots of people who swear by it. That's my dog barking. It doesn't work for me, journaling. It's it, it, it cumbersome for me. I don't do a, 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 a gratitude practice that some people talk about. That doesn't work for me. I apologize from dog in the background. She thinks anybody that comes to the door is trying to murder us. Um, she's a beautiful dog. So, you know, part of, of all of that can be part of your practice. And if somebody comes to me and saying, you know, taking long walks, exercising at the gym, meditating, you know, with a loving kindness meditation is one that I've used that I absolutely love on many occasions. But I have a mantra that I say under extreme stress when I'm, when I'm really, really anxious. And I can also use grounding techniques. I've never had a panic attack but I've helped people through them by using grounding techniques about thinking of, of, of the five senses, what they can feel, see, hear, taste, and so forth. So I love, I don't, I, I've heard of that Julia Cameron's Artist Way, I believe, but I've never, I've never, I've never read it. All right, no more questions and we're out of time. Plus my dog is gonna keep barking, I think. So, with that, let me just go through what's coming up. My two books, The Journey of the Rogue Parent and the, the Audacity to Be You are on, are on Amazon and Audible. If you want to give back and help people that can't afford therapy and treatment, our partners are Choose Mental Health. Go to choosementalhealth.org, skiesthelimitfund.org, or evokefamilyfoundation.org. We have support groups for, for current and alumni wilderness families and also for our, our, our intensives alumni. So if you're a wilderness alumni, June 16th is your next offering, June 16th at 6.30 p.m. We have a one, once a month, we have an alumni only meeting for, for our wilderness families. June 28th is the next offering and, and June 14th is the next intensive offering. Just email intensives at evoketherapy. Oh, I need to change that, Malia. Just email malia at evoketherapy.com for more information on our support groups or go to our, our, our webpage. If you want to do a deep dive into your own work as a therapy springboard 
or a therapy accelerator. Finding you is our offering. I swear by it. I can't think of a better way to spend time and money and resources to help everybody that you care about, but, but by doing your own work in this way, June 22nd is the next finding you June, July 14th. After that, um, we actually have a young adult one that's happening this weekend. Um, online, we have an offering in June, June 24th through 26th. Again, intensives at evoketherapy.com or go to our website. We have coaches, life coaches, parent coaches, marital coaches, um, virtual coaches that, that are trained in attachment theory. Just email coaching at evoketherapy.com or go to our website. We have a pursuits adventure trips, anywhere from three to 30 days, customized trips for families or adults. Think therapy light, therapy fun. We ask all current parents to attend six, 12 support groups just to try them out, to know what they're about, to know what's available. They're free. There aren't a lot of things that are free. Alanon.org, Coda.org, FamiliesAnonymous.org, or AdultChildren.org are places you can go for those. You can also go to RefugeRecovery.org or NAMI.org, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. They have free classes and resources in your local area. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app or Spotify. Just search Finding You an Evoke Therapy podcast, or go to soundcloud.com on your computer. You can also find all of these broadcasts with the visuals on Evoke's YouTube channel. <coughs> you can find Evoke or me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter uh, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Reedy, Dr. Brad Reedy. Or you can find the intensives program on Instagram at therapy, at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives or go to the Evoke Therapy blog, which has new content each week. All right, folks, uh, we'll, we'll send out an announcement for our next topic and, and the time for, for the broadcast. I don't have it handy right here. Thank you for joining me this evening. I hope it was a helpful point of contact and for and on behalf of the people that you love and that love you. Thank you for, for, for joining me and being willing to do your work because that's the only thing you can do or the best thing you can do for your children and for the people that you love is to work on yourself. Have a great evening and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.